Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to day two of the Library 2.014 conference. We have Dr. Daisy Sela Matsela here. Daisy, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Thank everybody. This is so fun. This is our fourth year of this conference. Huge thanks to the School of Information at San Jose State University. Uh, we're delighted to to have Rutgers in the form of CISL here this year sponsoring, thanks to Follett, Library Journal, the ever-stable Blackboard Collaborate, Wilson Consulting, Wilma, and Counting Opinions. This is a learningrevolution.com project. We encourage you to visit our site and see the variety of free conferences that we hold each year. Those of you who are in our live audience, this is a chance for you to indicate from where you're participating. Click on the star to the left of the map, then click on the map. It's fun if you put a note in the chat as well. It's still early morning on the west coast of the United States. Looks like we have East Coast, Canada, Europe, of course, South Africa. We are delighted to have you participating wherever you are. And those of you listening to the recording, we appreciate your taking the time to do so. OK, I'm going to turn the time over to you. And I will uh, be here for any help that you need for Q and A. Okay. Thank you and good uh, thank you and good afternoon from South Africa. It's almost four o'clock in the afternoon, and everybody's about to leave their office now. So it's only us and the information specialists who are sitting in the resource center listening to the talk this afternoon. And thanks for the opportunity. And it's my first time doing this, so I hope I won't be nervous. Okay, so my focus today is on, I just want to highlight the evolving roles that we pick up as information professionals, especially within the National System of, of Innovation in South Africa. And I will highlight what are the impediments and the challenges that we actually experience regarding what we are supposed to be doing based on what the National System of Innovation is expecting of us. So I have an outline here. I will focus first on the strategic context so that I give you an idea of what the National System of Innovation is all about. What are the knowledge society indicators that South African government is looking into for us to address uh, the knowledge society? I'll also look at the national strategies and the research landscape, the expectations thereof, and also the expected competences from the information specialists, the issues of transformation, and talent management, how are we actually addressing the transformation issues that we are faced with? So the National System of Innovation is a construct that is used to characterize a country's collective effort towards fostering technological innovation. This is documented in our South African 1996 white paper on science and technology. And the term has been used widely in South African policy discourses as you see on the policies and the mandates that I'm going to share with you this afternoon and this morning to you. So I just want to share with you the slide on what the National System of Innovation looks like. What are we talking about? And as you can see on the slide there we have the three centers which are the pillars. As you can see there, we have the universities, we have the science councils, we have the private sector, then we have the bigger blue structure which is the government. And this is the composition of the National Science uh, System of Innovation. But where do the funding agencies fit in here? You can see the middle ground there, the circle in between the science councils, universities, and private sector. That's where you have international funders and funding performance. So where I'm coming from, my institution, the National Research Foundation, it's a funding agency. For those based in the U.S., you all know the NSF. We are the equivalent of the NSF, but our mandate is much broader than the NSF because we also conduct research within our national facilities. So this is the structure of how the National System of Innovation 
it's embedded, and I just wanted to touch base so that you understand my premise on what I'll be talking about. So, the, the South African government, as part of its transformation objectives, is looking into having a knowledge society that will also contribute to the knowledge of economy, and our competitiveness should be global. In line with this, we have a number of policies and strategies that are in place that we need to adhere to, especially if you are in the higher education sector. We are looking at the National Research and Development Strategy. We are looking at the National Plan for Higher Education, the Human Resources Development Strategy for South Africa, the Department of Science and Technology Plan and Innovation Plan, the National Development Plan, and the Department of Education Research Funding Framework, the National Plan on Higher Education. All these policies, plans, and mandates have an impact on the way we do our activities and our workflows as information specialists. What are the indicators that the government of South Africa is trying to address, especially looking at the previous mandates I highlighted to you? Here we're looking at the indicators on the amount of money spent on research and development and the percentage of the gross, as part of the percentage of the gross domestic, domestic product. We're looking also at the qualitative measurement of use of ICTs and also access to ICTs. That's what we're looking at as an indicator. Another indicator that's quite key for the nation is the ability to produce high export technology. Also of importance for the past three years is the number of scientists in the country. At the moment, we are having close to 16,000 uh, researchers in our country, and out of that 16,000, only 5,000 are active researchers. And by active researchers, I mean the ones that have ISI-accredited ISI journals and impact factors. We are also looking, as part of our indicators, the number of patents filed as a nation. And what's key also to our role as information specialists from these indicators is the number or the impact of articles published by our researchers, and also not just published, but also in high ranked impact journals. So I'm asking myself, and I think you're also asking yourself, but what does this have to do with the information professional? Is it a government mandate on certain expectations? It has a lot to do with us, especially within the national system of innovation because of the expectations. And this is actually changing the way we used to do our role and the way we used to perform our jobs. I was trained differently in my profession, having started as a social scientist in psychology and sociology and moving to study knowledge management and to where I am today as a research manager. So what are the impediments? What are the expectations out of all those uh, mandates I discussed with you? The expectations are that we need to support research evaluation expectations for the National System of Innovation. You can see on your left hand side, it's the institution's expectation, and on the right hand side, it's the life and information sector or support service that we need to offer. The institutions are expecting us to assist with the evaluation and rating of researchers. I need to highlight here, when I talk about the evaluation and rating of researchers, South Africa is unique in a way that we have our own system where we grade, if I can use the word grading, our researchers to say, are you the best thing since sliced bread? And our researchers are ranked according to the profile that they have nationally and internationally based on their research output and their standing. And it's a merit review based process. And out of this, and if I can put it uh, mildly, it's sort of what you have with your Shanghai rankings, university rankings. But here we're only rating a researcher standing on the output and the kind of work that they do. And your peers actually attest to the work that you do. That's what we're talking about, the evaluation and rating of researchers. And this is administered by my institution. We're also, as a funding agency, we're also looking at grant proposals. But it's an expectation as part of research evaluation to assist researchers within the National System of Innovation, whether you are within a science council or within a university as an information specialist on their grant proposals. The identification of reviewers to ensure effective and proper merit review, even though we are using metrics, we also have to assist our researchers with that. Interpretation of indicators is quite key, and I highlighted to you the six indicators that are emanating from government uh, 
mandate. Another institutional expectation for information specialists who are expected to provide reliable measures of impact and competitiveness. The other thing that's quite core to our business at the moment is the business and competitive intelligence. What are we expected to perform and do to address the issues of business and competitive intelligence for institutions? And what kind of support are we expected? Bibliometrics, central metrics, we are expected to perform metrics and informatics. Systemic reviews and audits. When we talk about systemic reviews and audits, for example, we have programs that have to be reviewed and evaluated every five years because government wants to know whether the money that they invested in a particular funding instrument or program is it adding value, is it addressing societal needs, and is adding to the eco economy of the country. And we have to give metrics based on that. Also on field reviews, what's happening out there is a research area is adding value and whether we need to reinvest in that research area. We also have to offer research assessment exercises. And this we do multidimensional where we have universities and science councils within the NSI asking us to provide this kind of guidance and support. Departmental reviews are quite key. Departments within universities normally ask, they want to know what other or the niche areas within different universities. For example, a department from Stellenbosch University, the chemistry department would want to know how is the University of the Witwatersrand Rand doing as compared to them with regards to chemistry, for example, and we need to do analytics based on that. And we were never trained in life school to do that. We knew about bibliometrics, but it was not in detail. We also need to assist with performance appraisals of our researchers, especially as it relates to ratings. You are talking internationally about uh, tenure of office as an academic or professor. In South Africa, we don't have tenure, but what we have is performance appraisals where if you are a rated researcher, like I alluded to the evaluation and rating of researchers, you get cloud if you're an A-rated researcher or a B-rated researcher or a C-rated researcher, and that's where you move from being an associate professor to being a full professor in South Africa, and that's quite key. So as you can see, the NIA support, these are the things that are coming to the forefront based on the mandate from government and based on all those policies that are highlighted to you. And this is also stretching us to actually learn on trial and error on whatever we're doing within the NSI. My second slide also covers, uh, I just pressed the wrong button now, the research, uh, the research evaluation expectations. As you can see there, the National Science and Technology requests. We have to compare nationally and internationally what are other higher education institutions doing and even the other science councils. And we need to give service to that. Scientific fields and disciplines, we have what we call the South African Research Chairs and also the South African Centers of Excellence. The Research Chairs, it's an idea that we took from Canada, but because of our research cohort and what we want to achieve as a nation, especially looking at the knowledge economy and the knowledge society, when we talk about scientific fields and disciplines, here the institutions normally ask us, and also the institutions, the National Research Foundation as a funding agency to say, you as information specialists, can you please identify areas where we can put our investment in? Can you please identify areas in these scientific fields and disciplines where we can get uh, distinguished professors or academics who can come and work in, our, in the country and then they can advise the institutions? At institutional level, we also get a request where universities, which would be your corporate level and your divisional level where you get a university also asking for certain services to be delivered to them and also from divisional level where you get departments, institutes or centers also wanting benchmarking amongst one another or on a global scale or on a country scale and uh, a global scale. We also have research programs and funding instruments that the, the NRS as a funding agency fund and we also have to ensure that we provide support in the way of it's either metrics, your bibliometrics or your age index or your, cit your citation index and so forth for our uh, researchers and also for people who will be sitting in the review panels for them to make a, a judgment. Remember, even though we are using merit review, we are also using metrics 
in cases of doubt, to determine the outcome of the uh, particular uh, output. The other thing that's quite key also for the South African landscape, especially within the higher education sector and the science council, is the issue of collaboration. When we fund our researchers, we always ask and say, whom are you collaborating with? Whom are you in partnership with? Because that actually elevates the status of our research and we show that our researchers are actually nurtured and mentored in an appropriate way. And this also plays another burden to say, as an information professional or specialist, what are you able to do for us to be able to collaborate? And that's why, as you can see on my top slide, I highlighted the issue of knowledge management. And within knowledge management, one of the key things that we do, for example, to address the issue of collaboration or partnership would be establishing of the establishment of community of practice to assist, for example, the centers of excellence that are scattered across the country to collaborate, to talk to one another, and also to explain what communities of practice or COPs are, and also establish them, set them up as virtual uh, uh, platforms. Our other role that's expected of us at the moment is the issue of research data management. It's quite key that we are advancing globally with what's happening out there. We know that our researchers have lots of data, but we are also aware that our data resides out of South Africa. For example, the kind of data that I'm talking about will be pollination data. We have data from the east coast of South Africa but we don't have it embedded in our systems here. What we know for sure is that the data is sitting with a, uh, one of our counterparts in the US. And it's quite important for us to ensure that we understand the issue of research data management as it relates to grant management. If a researcher requests or receives a grant from the institution, there must be a clause indicating where are you going to deposit your data. But as an information specialist, you must also give guidance to say, if you don't have an avenue for you to deposit the data, where can you deposit the data? Which other data archives can you use? And that's what we're talking about here. The issues of open access, we're also grappling with this issue at the moment. We don't have a national policy on open access. And my institution at the moment, we are busy looking at an issue of an open access mandate for our grant holders. What are the expectations? Because we pick it up that if we don't come up with an open access mandate indicating what needs to happen with open source and open data, we won't be able to manage funding as public good. The other issue of records and documents management also ties in with expectations from the institutions. Previously, records and documents were before 1994, before the new South African dispensation, we did have records and documents management, but it was classified differently. And now we all as government entities have to follow through with the national archives directions that there should be proper records and documents management and all the records must be classified, especially if it's public records. And it's also one thing that we never learned from library school in the old days, but it's now it's one of those courses that are coming up as part of the library curricula on the management of records and documents, either in the hard copy format and also in electronic format. It's another challenge that we are faced with and we also have to deal with it head on. The other issue of digitization and preservation and intellectual property rights. It's also an issue for us because we have indigenous knowledge systems in the country. We have researchers who come and take the IPs from the communities and we also don't digitize and preserve. And this is the other skill that we feel that we are lacking somewhere, but we have to do things on trial and error and learn from like a situation of today while learning from other colleagues who, who are presenting for the whole week. This is also a challenge that we are faced with as part of our, the role that we perform. Research integrity is quite key also within the national system of innovation and there's an expectation from the information specialist to ensure that whenever a researcher or a scientist asks for something, we also advise on the issue of research integrity and also plagiarism, which is quite key. The issue of pre-evaluation of outputs, we also provide a service on that, especially with the bibliographic information. Before the outputs are submitted into a journal publication, we also have to assist in that regard. And previously, we were not 
doing this, but it's now the things that are coming to the fore for us to be able to assist because our researchers are under a lot of pressure to publish because they want to be rated researchers. They want either want to be an A-rated researcher or a B-rated researcher or a P-rated researcher. So they also want to be promoted within their ambit and it's quite key for them to be rated and we also need to provide that kind of support. Another key thing that's unique to South Africa is the subsidy from the Department of Higher Education and Training for any publication or output that a researcher or an academic puts out there in an accredited journal. Based on that, there is also demand from the information specialist side to say, you must provide us with the accredited journals that are accredited by the Department of Higher Education and Training. Also, when they submit, the institutions submit to the Department of Higher Education and Training, the list that they submit, we need to ensure that the submissions are appropriate, the submissions are completed efficiently, and then the, the referencing is done properly because there's a subsidy attached to this. Whatever you publish, you get money for that. And that's the carrot and stick approach from the government to ensure that for us to reach that and knowledge society and knowledge economy, we need to fast track the process, and whenever you publish, you get funding out of that to help you publish better. The other key thing that's also, as part of the institutional requirements for us to be able to deliver on research evaluation expectation is the issue of liaising with the research offices. As you all know, traditionally, librarians and information specialists, we work in our little corners, and that's it. But the trend has moved also to say, even if you are a, uh, a librarian or information specialist in a research environment, you must have that proactive relationship with the research office. When it comes to your e-resources collection, collection management, you also need to have that relationship with the research office to understand their research needs for the entire uh, university or science council. Also, relationship with the researchers is quite key at the moment because the researchers also, like I alluded on the first slide about rating of researchers, they also want to have that uh, sound box to say, how do I know before I submit, I subject myself for review whether I'm the best thing since life's break. And then that's where we give guidance to say, look up your, uh, your, your metrics, look out your age index and check how your citation profile and so forth. And also, you know, we advise on the publish or perish sites so that they can actually map themselves before they can actually subject themselves because it's quite difficult, as you all know, when you publish and you're told, oh, you're still there, you're not up there. And then, you know, the egos are also at hand when you have your publication out there. So we also are in the position where we have to advise our researchers. So it's actually taking a lot out of us because we all learn by trial and error in this area. I'm struggling with the buttons again here. Yeah? Whilst I've highlighted the evolving role that we perform based uh, to ensure that we support the research evaluation requests from our institutions, we're also faced with transformation challenges. And as a nation where we come from, we have an aging cohort of information specialists. In the old days, before I even entered the field of library information science, I remember my first time registering at a library school, the number of African students that would find there and the number of white students that would find there to use the South African terminology. And today, the legacy sitting with us where we have an aging cohort of more white South Africans who are well endowed and are specialists in the area. And they are trying as much to share their expertise with the young ones. But now the gap between now and the time they leave the employer, and it's, the, it's not a thing that you can just hand over now because of the trial and error that they've learned through the process and also the engraving and the embedding and understanding of the system. And that's also having an impact on the way we need to do things. Workplace representation is also an issue. We need to, as part of South Africa and the new nation, we need to ensure that uh, representativity is quite key when we also make placements. And it's also a challenge because then you have to look at the issue of race. You also have to look at the issue of balance with gender. And how do you get that, knowing that the library information sector in South Africa, we still have uh, more females and less males 
joining the profession, and it, is to be, it used to be like that in the old days. Lucky for now, we have the balance of males and females holding positions in libraries. We do have vacancies available in our system, but we have vacancies that are available, but the entry requirements, we are, majority of us are looking for people who will come in and do the job. And that's a dilemma that we are faced with. That what are we doing about those ones, the new graduates, who don't have exposure to all these opportunities? When we say, for this position, if I want a digitization librarian or a metadata librarian, I need a person who's fully fledged can come and just take this job and do it. What are we doing about the others who just graduated? And that's a dilemma that we are faced with at the moment. Lack of required competencies. We do have vacancies, but we don't have the right skills. We are lacking in certain skills. Yes, we have the papers, we have the qualifications, we have the certificates, but we don't have the exposure and experience in actually handling what the expected job competencies are. And how do we intend to address this? One of the things that is happening in the country to address the issue of transformation and ensuring that the young ones who are coming into the profession are actually roped into and fast tracked into the process because we have this juncture between academia, what you learn in life school, and what's actually happening in the workplace and how do we bridge that gap. So as part of the remedial process, we have uh, the national internship program taking place in the country. And this national internship program started four years ago and it has gained momentum for the past three years. And this is managed by the Department of Science and Technology. And my institution, the National Research Foundation, actually administers the funding and the advertisement of internship programs to prospective undergraduate students and postgraduate students to come and, uh, and, uh, and be selected and placed across the country at different institutions. So the target for this national internship program is to ensure that any unemployed science, engineering, and technology graduate. Here we're not excluding the humanities and the social sciences. Every field of area from media studies to your ICT, they are all covered in here. Even life and information science, they are provided with opportunities. So the, the graduates have to apply, and then they are roped into the process, and they are given practical work experience through mentorship and exposure to a research environment. And the expectations are quite different in such a way that they're not expected to just come in for a year. The cycle is a year. To just come in for a year and push trolleys or be Davis T. girl. No. The expectation is such that they actually need to be exposed. They actually need to be trained and also given the actual work to do because they are also measured in the process. And as part of that, they are also taken through project management skills courses by the office that manages the internship program for the country. And students meet on an annual basis. I would refer to them as students because they are still students even though they are intense. They meet on an annual basis where they are given all these other softer skills to ensure that when they finish their internship program within a year, they are ready for the world of work. And at the moment, these uh, internship programs fellows they are given close to just about 600 US dollars per month as a stipend for them to be able to come to wherever they are placed and do the job that they need to do. So we are looking at when we address this issue of transformation and the aging cohort, we are looking at uh, students or graduates who are interested in research management, research support and administration, and they're actually placed in public higher education institutions and also research agencies. And we feel that this is quite a good initiative because if I can reflect the five, the three students that we had the last year, the interns that we had last year, we had three of them, they were all absorbed before the term of office. Their term of office starts the 1st of uh, April until the 31st of March, the following year. But by December 2013, one, uh, one in ten uh, gr uh, graduate actually got a placement with the uh, 200 public libraries. And the beginning of the year this year, two of our intents also got placement with one of our 
sectors out here. So the program is quite, quite actually waiting because some of the students, once they are in the sector, being exposed to mentorship and mentorship and exposure to the world of work, they decide whether they want to be future academics and they decide to go further and do their further studies other than just going to the world of work. And that's why we want to balance this. And for us, we think that it's a quite a good opportunity because in the old days, we never had opportunities like this. You graduate and you are left on your own and you end up doing menial jobs in the area that you are not trained in. So colleagues, in closing, that's a story that for us in South Africa, especially within the National System of Innovation, we are looking forward to the challenges like I highlighted to you, the research evaluation expectations from the system, and for us as information specialists, how do we actually bridge that divide to ensure that we address our limited competencies and sharing our resources and also forming community practice to ensure that we learn from one another on trial and error and we don't repeat the mistakes and we share our resources equitably. And the slide that you see now is just to show off what the National Research Facility uh, Foundation is all about and those are our facilities within the country. Like I indicated to you that we are the equivalent of the NSF but we do research and those are our facilities where we do research and they are part of the National Science Foundation. And thank you very much. This is the closing of my slide. Thank you very much. I'll await any questions now. Thank you. So to clap, you hover over the smiley face in the participant window and go down to the applause. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we will um, look for them. Or you can actually raise your virtual hand. Dr. Hirsch says, is there anything that other schools, such as our San Jose State University School of Information, can do to help bridge the gap of new entering information professionals? Okay, I don't know how to answer that uh, one, but I know for sure that the Library and Information Association of South Africa has a program through the Carnegie Corporation of New York where uh, practicing professionals are actually giving, provided with short courses to bridge the gap. That's one I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. But with our library schools, there's that disjuncture that some of our library schools we have some universities used to have, out of the 25 universities that we have, we only have four to five library schools. And out of the four to five library schools that we have, the curriculum is not the same. And that's also a challenge. The curriculum is not the same. And when you want to attract prospective graduates to come and work with you and you want to train them as part of the intensive program, that's when you pick up that there is a disjuncture and there's a lot that needs to be carried on from the world of work as compared to the theory that they studied at university. So it will be interesting, I think, offline to hear what the colleagues can share with us regarding the bridging the gap for new information uh, professionals. I'm really interested that you have a national innovation system and that you have excellent centers and you're talking about communities of practice. Are you able to measure the yes. impact of this infrastructure? Are there ways that you are tracking success? Yes. We do have within the, uh, my institution, we do have uh, mechanisms like I indicated that every five years we review programs and funding instruments. We do review them whether there was value of it and whether we have to continue funding these possibilities because we also have to report that to government, to central government, and that's what government wants. Government does not, does not just dish out money to say, oh, this year I'm going to give millions like this. Before they give those millions, they want to know how the funding instrument or the program performed for the past five years. And then we have to attest to that and give it. That's why our role as information professionals to actually give those in, work on the indicators and also give the metrics to attest to the narratives that we get from the review panel. It is interesting how you've been so thoughtful in identifying the conditions 
and the requirements that help innovation occur through uh, library and information sciences. It seems as though you've done a really good job identifying those uh, roles and um, activities that actually help innovation. Uh, like I said earlier, it's a matter, for us it has been a matter of trial and error because you are in the practice and you get bombarded with all these requests and then you have to go back to say, oh, by the way, there's this mandate from government, by the way, there's this strategic document from government and as discussions are evolving within the organization and institutions that this is happening, we also need to be in the forefront as leaders to say, what do we need to do to address a, B, and C. And I think that's what's a bit of helping us to ensure that even though when we groom future professionals in the area, we groom them in the line of expectation from the external world. So if you have a question for Dr. Selimatella, please put it in the chat or raise your virtual hand. I'm going to keep asking questions. <laughs> <For easy. laughs> Probably for easier for me to pronounce. <laughs> um, do, have you looked at other countries who have instituted similar systems of innovation? Have, have there been particular uh, examples that you have tried to follow? Not necessarily from the information specialist side, but I know from the institutional side, for example, the South African research chairs model was taken from Canada. For us to be able to have the research chairs where Capacity is built internally, but out of in, uh, internal capacity within the universities and the science councils, then we get specialists, researchers and professors from different countries to come and actually assist us in the mentorship, the research output, and also the training of our students. That one, yes, we do have evidence of that and we also have documentation attesting to that. But from the information specialist side, I only gave the perspective from especially the science councils, where we're actually bombarded with this thing of you have to be an information specialist, but again, this side you have to give a carrot and stick approach to say, if you don't do this, this is, these are the consequences, which is quite difficult, especially when we look at the issues of data management and records and document management. So very interesting. Are there any other questions? Daisy, thank you for taking the time and for doing such a terrific job. Thank you very much to all the listeners out there and the participants and I hope we can connect online and for me it was an eye opener, first time I'm doing this, uh, this kind of presentation here but I really enjoyed my presentation. You did a Thank fine you very much. job. I'm sorry that you were nervous. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks to Daisy. We are having a really fun second day of the Library 2.014 conference. We hope that you will join us for some of the many, many sessions still to come today. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye. <laughs>